Hello, friends, and welcome to the No Clip Podcast, episode 39. I'm your host, Danny, and this week I'm delighted to be joined by friend of the show, creator of Eternal Daughter, I'm OK, Aquaria, Spelunky, and now Spelunky 2. It's out this week, so we're delighted to be joined uh, by Derek Yu. Derek, how you doing? Good. You, you went far back with that intro. <laughs> Did I miss out with Eternal Daughter, and I was like, whoa. Hey, well, I guess I it's forgot daughter. we talked about all that stuff. Right, yeah, Corey, yeah, it's 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 been a while. It was yeah. like January twenty seventeen, I think, was when we did our doc on Spelunky. Yeah, uh, that feels a, like ages ago. A long, long time ago. Yeah, although in the grand scheme of Spelunky time, it's not all that long. Because th- didn't the original version come out in like I'm guess I'm talking Flash here, but was it two thousand eight? Yeah. Right so it's been about ten. 10-ish years since the first version of Spelunky came out. A decent chunk of your life. Um, So we've loads to talk about. I'm really excited to talk about it. I kind of want to preface this by saying that one of the most important things about a game like Spelunky is the discovery that you have as a player. So I'm not going to start peppering you with questions about, you know, (laughs) secrets and like what's what and whatnot. But I do want to get into like some of the sort of like uh, decisions that... Uh, I guess, made Spelunky 2 the sequel that it is because you could have just gone in so many different uh, directions with this. And the way you went um, uh, maybe wasn't necessarily what I was expecting, but it's it's absolutely what I've... I'm relishing it more, perhaps, because of the type of sequel that you've you've created. Um, First of all, I want to talk about the uh, development process for this, right? Because... Uh, you worked with Blitworks on the console version of Spelunky. Is that correct? You've had a relationship with those folks for a while. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so, I mean, now it feels very fortuitous and serendipitous, but we met Blit because Sony just hooked us up with them to do the port of Spelunky to PS4. Or I guess at the time it was PS3 and then <laughs> PS Vita and PS4. Yeah, PS3, wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they just said, you know, I'd like to introduce you to Blitworks. They're going to be doing the port. I think at the time, we were one of the first ports that they did. So they're primarily known as a porting company. And now I think they're pretty legendary for doing ports, uh, particularly of indie games. They've done a ton. Um, Are they based in Spain? Yeah, they're in Barcelona. Oh, cool. So I think they, you know, I think initially they did... Spelunky, I, I'm pretty sure they did Fez early on. Oh, right. Since then, they've done all kinds of yeah ports. Um, so this is their first game where they've like built it from scratch, from the ground up. It's, um, and, and I'm really interested in this because did that basically sort of like let you entirely focus on design? Like, did you do much programming on this one, much at all? Like, how did that how did that work get split? Yeah, no, I did. I did level design, um, but I I pretty much only did art design and and level design. Um, and yeah, the, the the tools that we have are are just way better now. With with Spelunky one, I did actually go into the code and do some programming. I mean, not that much, but you know, I actually did like touch the code, particularly like the level generation code. I right. I copied it over from Game Maker into. C++ and actually did some. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm more removed from that. Um, and, you know, them just being like a big team lets us do more for Spelunky too. Like, you know, all the features and, and yeah, better tools and things like that. Uh, people are always really surprised when I tell them that with Spelunky 1, like we didn't even have source control. You know, Andy and I were just passing a zip file of the game back and <laughs> forth to each other uh, just to, to back it up. And uh, yeah, I mean, Andy did like an amazing job as the sole programmer of Spelunky 1. Um, It was just like an incredible Herculean task for him, especially, you know, coming coming to the development as a wooden toy designer. That was his previous job before working on Spelunky on Xbox. So 
Yeah, he did great. Um, but for Spelunky too, I you know having a like a full team of just super coders. I mean, to be fair, you know it's not like all of Blitworks has been working on Spelunky too. So there's like a core group of of people at Blitworks that have. Yeah, been, how, how many are we talking about? Like I'm sure. Uh, like like a of... couple like main programmers, and then, um, you know, like s- some support programmers that that have helped at various stages. Like uh, you know, like a, a network programmer for the online multiplayer. Right. But primarily, yeah, a couple a couple of programmers. There's Mickey Pasquale and. Um, Javi Moya are like kind of the two, the two main programmers from Blit that have been helping out. So, so what was that creative process like then for you? Because you know, did you? You obviously still absolutely loads of work to do in terms of art and level design and and and, and managing of this project and everything. But did it free you up a little bit more, or did it give you more? I guess could you be a little bit more dangerous with the ideas that you wanted to implement into Spelunky 2 because you knew you had sort of like a like a broader team uh, with specialists that could maybe make that stuff happen? Yeah, for sure. And I think it really helped the fact that Blitworks had worked on Spelunky 1 and were pretty intimately familiar with it, just having done the port. And so, you know, I mean, they knew they knew like what the engine needed to have in it and and what kind of tools would be useful. And they just, you know, they understood the the original design. So, you know, a lot of the, I think that's really important um, just to, for me to be able to convey certain ideas and have them understand, you know, within the context of Spelunky 1, like, okay, this is going to be like Spelunky 1, but it's going to be a little different in this way or that. Um, right. And, you know, we were used to working with each other remotely too. So it was like a pretty seamless transition. I, I've always thought that, you know, it's really important that the, I think the the team dynamics and the personality of the team also match. And, you know, to do a sequel to Spelunky, I think that was... I, I would not feel comfortable just working with a, a team that didn't have any familiarity with Spelunky 1. Um, you know, even if they just played Spelunky 1 a lot, I think that's different than having actually worked on it. And so that was, you know, doing the port to PS3, I think was also just like a proof of concept of just us working well together and they're all right. just like really chill guys um who yeah i think we're i think we're cool with with working remotely and um i mean who would turn yeah, down that like, project right like who turned down working on spelunky too it seems like a it seems like a for any um uh person working in games that it's it's like a, a fun opportunity um especially if you have been involved in the first one um, I'm i'm interested in like what was it like then from you as a you know creative director you know key stakeholder uh, key master of this project to work with them did you just kind of like I've, I've read that when you were when you wrote your boss fight books for spelunky that it started to stir some ideas for you but did you just you know turn up you know with a, with a tome of like this is the design of spelunky too or or how much was that uh, back and forth over months and years to sort of find what spelunky 2 was you know, I was looking actually at the like initial design document that I sent to them, um, and there's there's definitely some stuff in there that did not make it, but like the basic design was kind of in place. I was I was actually surprised like how how close it was, and this was only like a couple page design document, maybe like a few pages. I just like wrote it in a Google Doc and sent it over. Um, so you know, a lot of the basic ideas were there and kind of like marinated while I was working on the on the boss fight books and it, it kind of just it was based around you know like sort of like a few high level concepts and then just some bigger features that that I knew that I wanted to have in the game like that second layer behind the the first layer of, mm. of each level um, and being able to go like in and out between them and and mounts and um like the branching pads and things like that in the game. And just, you know, I think the the higher level concept of just yeah, just kind of like blowing out the design and and kind of, you know, just pushing all of the the concepts that are fun in Spelunky 1 to like as far as we can take them, right? Right. So, yeah, it, it I mean, after that initial design document, how do you know, we mostly worked actually from just like 
a single Google Doc, I think, for for the majority of the development, just like adding adding ideas to there and and kind of just building it that way. And then you know, um, eventually we added we added a Slack and uh, to to kind of talk through ideas and things like that. But you know, we we got through the development with like a surprisingly few amount of like meetings you know like teleconference <laughs> meetings it was wow living the dream very much kind of like past yeah just like ideas passed back and forth through through google docs and slack and how much of it then was was just play testing and like iterative adding stuff in seeing how it feels like it feels like that type it must be that type of game um is that the case that you're just like creating new versions of it playing it feeling out what's working tweaking stuff like how much of it is in that minutia yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we're always doing a lot of play testing, and this time around, actually, we have um, a QA like team. Oh, cool! Who's been working on the game throughout the development? Just yeah, testing, testing it, um, like as we've been developing it, which is a, a new thing because with Spelunky One, we we did have a, a testing group that came in, but it was more toward the end, um, and it was like a, a group that Microsoft brought in to help us, just with the very end to kind of be able to pass certification right um so this time around we've had people uh at lollipop robot testing the game oh, as, cool. as we develop um but yeah i don't know i mean the i think as far as the testing goes like you know we never really found anything that was like that like just didn't work and i think i don't know i, I kind of tried to design it that way it it seems kind of weird but like you know I, I I think it, these days I'm really trying to start projects where I, like I'm not anticipating a lot of huge snags, you know. Like with Spelunky too, I feel like I understood eighty percent of the game before we started, so mm. it, it wasn't. I didn't feel like there was going to be a lot of kind of like exploration. I think the I think the main like challenge was really just executing on the idea. Right. Um, and of course, you know, you're, you're discovering all kinds of things as, as you're working, but for the most part, like those big ideas that we had to the, in the start really just made it through to the end, you know, and there was nothing where it was like, okay, this really isn't working. We need to, we need to go back. Um, and, you know, I think I generally, I had the mindset of like, you know, if we're going to, if we make something, let's just, let's just like keep it in the game. <laughs> right. You know, like let's, let's not take it out. Let's just, um, you know, tweak it, tweak it a little bit maybe, but, um, Spelunky at this point, I think, I think like we understand it pretty well. And so we were able to just like come up with an idea add it. And for the most part, like find a way to make it work. And, you know, the idea with this one was also just to make it like a big game, you know, like a very rich and dense game. And so it just, you know, any ideas that, that I came up with, it felt like, well, if it didn't quite work here, there's another part of the game where we could find a place to work. So in that sense, I think the development was very efficient, um, which was just sort of designed, I think, into the project itself. Like, right. this is a sequel. This is a game we understand well. You know, let's just take the time we have and just like actually make the game and not spend like too much time kind of fiddling around. Right. Yeah. It, it makes sense considering like if you talk to players of Spelunky, they are, you know, especially folks who played it for a long time, they are considered to be very well versed in the language of Spelunky as players. So it makes sense that as the creators, you would have that sort of, um, uh, like full view of everything and understanding when you're plugging something in or adding a feature, sort of having a pretty good idea of how it will f affect everything else, just considering how much time you've spent in that world. And also, like, it's been a couple of years between Spelunky 1 and 2. It's not like you just pushed out a sequel um, right away. I I I'm interested in one of the things that I found very interesting right off the bat was that it, it feels like it controls almost the exact like the exact same way as Spelunky 1 like when I picked up the controls and started moving my character around and even like menus and you know it doesn't it's it's it, it feels very familiar and comfortable um right off the bat and even down to like the way 
bombs bounce off walls and like just all those little bits was that like always just going to be the case that you wanted to like have a certain you know the foundation of the original game was going to remain untouched yeah i i think it was important to feel like well there's no reason to reinvent the wheel on everything right like if you know even with even with the menus and kind of like the basic structure of how the game starts and takes you into the menu it just I didn't really feel particularly inspired to change it that much. And, you know, I think that one of the main themes of Spelunky is kind of this this idea that things happen in circles, right? Like you're playing as the uh, daughter of the protagonist of the first game. And um, it's, you know, it's a sequel. That's kind of like what a sequel is. It's like you're going back to, to a game. And, uh, and so... Yeah, I think that that familiarity was uh, um, fine with me. I think it was great, and that just gave us more room to, like, for, you know, the the for the new things that we added to the game to spend more time on those things because we didn't have to reinvent the wheel on everything. And so I think it was you know it was important not to try to like change every single part of Spelunky for the sake of of changing it. Um, and you know, I think like the first level in I, I see a lot of people playing the game, and they call the first the first area of Spelunky Two the mines, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not called the mines in Spelunky Two; it's called dwelling. Um, but they call it the mines because it is it does remind them of the mines from Spelunky One, and I part of that is because yeah, I think the mines work really well as a first area in Spelunky One. And while there are a lot of you know significant changes to it, I think the overall feeling of it is is similar because. Yeah, it it worked pretty well, like in general in in Spelunky One. So this is more of like like a remix of yeah. of that that area with a lot of familiar elements like snakes and and bats and and stuff like that. Well, you know, it's they... kind of like in every Mario game. You know, you, the first enemy you're gonna stomp on is a Goomba or whatever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and I remember that sense of uh, of variations on a theme with the original game when you went into the different biomes and you know it's it's like in what ways are the are the rules playing out differently in this area? Um and and you know without getting too deep into the 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 tile sets and the the different biomes you've created um you know with the sort of the split off that happens at the end of dwelling as well it's kind of similar in that like there's a sort of a tropical jungle-ish area and you know of a, a, a volcano-ish sort of hellish area which again they have it's like it's rooted in that familiarity but but there's obviously a whole new rule set to it um do you think that was important to have like like i'm just interested in the process of having the dwelling be that familiar uh, it's not the exact same why so why not, basically the question is why not just recreate the mines why 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 how much change is too much change and how much change is not enough change Right. Well, you know, I, I did think about the fact that this was going to be people's like first area that they're experiencing the game through. Like, this is the first thing that they're going to see. And I, so I did want it to be different enough so that they didn't feel like, OK, I'm just playing Spelunky one again. Like, I'm, you know, just I'm just going to turn <laughs> off the game. I, I've played this before. So I did feel like it had to be that first area had to be different enough hmm. so that they wouldn't get, you know, they wouldn't feel like it was too familiar um so yeah I, I think it was important to make it like just familiar enough that uh you know they could feel kind of comfortable if they played the original game but feel like it was different enough that it was that they felt like it was worth it to have bought the sequel yeah um and i was very excited when one of those punching uh uh, walls didn't instantly kill me like because I, I i accidentally rubbed up against one and thinking of the jungle and the spikes being like oh shit and then i was like oh no that's okay that's good um the, yeah we tried to make it look like nice and blunt the, yeah. the end of those those sticks that hit you so a little bit softer maybe a yeah. concussion but i'll i'll survive it <laughs> Um, let's let's talk about some of those changes then. Uh, you mentioned already that sort of like second layer, the sort of the very satisfying Paper Mario sense I got when I went through and and saw the the area uh, behind. Um, give me, I guess, I guess like secret areas that were always one of the most fascinating parts of the original Spelunky, and you know, blowing up areas and figuring out where those little portals were and the doors and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
uh, what was what was, what were you trying to like achieve with this? Be- and also, I- I'm asking this question knowing full well that I have only scratched the surface of what that system is doing because there's there's clearly uh, only. I actually have, for people watching the video, I have Spelunky 2 on the television behind me. That's not because I put it up for effect. I've just been playing a shitload of it this morning as well. Um, and, and earlier, just about an hour ago, I, I did something and I was like, oh, sh- I got to go back and do this again. Um, but yeah, t- t- tell me a little bit about where the idea for that sort of going through the door and having that second layer behind the f- the, the, the main layer, uh, where did that come from? That was actually, that just came from a phone call I had with Andy Hull, who was the programmer for Spelunky 1. Um, but you know, Andy like contributed a lot of design ideas to Spelunky one also just in, in the role of a programmer. Uh, he's just a very, like, he's a, he's a good programmer, but he's also a good artist and, and designer. He's, he's like a generalist. So, you know, the, the whole layer two, that's what we call it. Um, like just behind the scenes is just Mm. layer two, but with layer two, the idea just yeah came from a phone call with Andy where I was talking to him about wanting to do a sequel and just I just wanted to get his like thoughts about that and he just said at one point you know what you should add to Spelunky too Derek <laughs> and he just described the basic idea of like yeah like a doors where you you just go in and it like takes you behind the level and that was it we we never talked about that whole layer two idea past that but as soon as he said it i was like that is a fantastic idea and then you know having that basic idea um we just we played around with it during development and and it worked out really well so yeah that was like like andy just made this you know the very beginning before we had even really started working on the game he just made this like with this one sentence just added this huge feature to the game. <laughs> My mic drop on a phone call. Was was he yeah, involved exactly. much at then, all in the, throughout the process? Throughout the process? No, not I mean, yeah, aside from from yeah, that that big big idea. No, aside from just like being a friend and us just kind of just chatting about what we're what we're working on. He was working on Dunk Lords. Yeah. Which is his arcade basketball game that came out this year also yeah and it's super fun um so yeah we were working on our separate projects but still like kept in touch and just like kept kept each other up to date awesome so we were like it was it was more like moral support for each other (laughs) yeah while we were working on it but yeah that that feature was was andy's uh initial brainchild and and ended up being i think a great way of just expanding how you can discover secrets and just kind of the secretive feeling of Spelunky in general. Yeah, it gives you it gives me that sense at least that there's always something else going on behind the scenes of a level that I don't know about. Um, which even if even if it's only a small thing, just the possibility space that exists in my brain now of of the scale scale of these levels is is totally uh, changed. Um, one of the moments that me and my wife have been playing a bunch of this, we we adored playing the first game together. Um, uh over the years and uh our sort of big holy shit moment was the first time we destroyed one of those lava pools and seeing the um the physics just the the, what happens where i just like killed a bunch of stuff that was underneath it when it started pouring out on everyone else and i'm interested in that from a design perspective because uh the original spelunky is sort of it's quite like you know it's a grid it's rigid things go a certain way i guess you know things have arcs there's bombs and, and enemies can fly around but you're you you sort of have like a lot of constraints on it there's something about the fluid dynamics that feels like oh this is like chaos like how can they design around this um what was it like adding those in? like what was the idea behind adding in the that sort of like fluid dynamic system and were you scared at all that it was going to sort of have a you know it might trap people or ruin their way out of the levels or anything like that yeah i I really like the grid format just for games. There's something just very video gamey about that, right? I mean, that's like old games, that's they're all tile based like that. And I don't know, there's something just that just really like lights up my imagination. It's like partly maybe some childhood nostalgia, but but also just uh I don't know, you just the the idea that you can kind of see this map and sort of understand it at a glance because everything is is set to to a grid. I think is really cool. But then, 
at the same time we're making like a modern game and so i think it's fun to try to break out of that grid when we can and the the lava and the fluid was you know one of the main ways that we were able to do that and make this grid-based game feel very dynamic at times same with the moles in the first area you know they <laughs> fuck those moles there <laughs> yeah exactly i've heard that a lot but yeah they you know the way they kind of like cut through the grid and they move like diagonally yeah in the ground yeah um it's very upsetting yeah, no, I think it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of subverts your your expectations a little bit seeing this this grid based map and then having these elements kind of like yeah destroy that grid. Um, yeah, you. I mean the the lava definitely creates you know it can cause cause people a lot of trouble, but you know to to begin with it's always static. So generally, when it blows up, it's like you're responsible for it. <laughs> And I think that's important. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, that was something that actually, that was a feature that I think we wanted to have in Spelunky 1, but we just weren't able to do it. Yeah, it does it, seem like the type of thing that perhaps having Blit on on task as well is helpful in, in, in figuring out or implementing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, that was just, it's really just a feature that, uh, that I think we wanted to have in Spunky One, and now we're we're able to finally have it, and it it seemed to work out pretty well. That's cool. I love I love it's, that idea. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's just, I it's just fun to look at. I think just having like these oh, waterfalls, yeah. just and I, you know, that's a big <laughs> like idea with Spelunky Two, which is just that I want people to to play play around with the game and not focus so much on beating it um which i think it's a difficult concept for people to wrap their head around and i've i've seen comments from people who are like oh you know like spelunky one was so hard and or i haven't played spelunky one you know am i going to enjoy spelunky two and you know people will say well yeah i think spelunky two is like even harder and it, i think it kind of scares people off a little bit but um i I think of it like, you know, it is a hard game, but that's really just, you know, I've said this before, but it's really just like a backdrop for, like the challenge is really just a backdrop for people to just play and experiment. And I think the people who, you know, if you see the like really experienced Spelunky players play, they will constantly just kill themselves in the name of learning a little more about the game. They're like, okay, I'm just going to try this see what happens and then they die and they learn a little bit and i, I feel like with newer players or p players who are you know a little more scared off by spelunky i think they think of it as a game where like i have to i have to beat it like it's yeah. something to beat and if i can't beat it then i'm somehow failing but you know in my head spelunky is in many ways it's like a sandbox experience where um you know, instead of just, even though it's like linear where you're going from, from point A to point B, essentially. And, you know, I think in the long term, you are trying to, to beat the game. I think in the short term, there are other things that, that you can try to do, you know, even at the cost of your own, own life, right? Like just learning how the systems work blowing up a lava pool and just seeing the lava flow and just kind of just standing there and just seeing, seeing how cool that is, you know, um, finding like fun ways to die. Right. So I think that, you know, the fluid is also, I think just works into that, that whole concept of like, it's just a fun thing to see. Um, and I think, you know, there, there are a lot of things like that, that we added to Spelunky that are kind of just, it's not really there to be like a really balanced, obstacle on your path to becoming like a spelunky master it's it's also there just because it's funny and just because like it's a it's a fun thing to look at or or, or do while you're playing so i don't know I, that's something that i really would like people to try to understand i think there are things built into the game to try to help you understand that but you know whenever i get an opportunity to talk about it i feel like i want to tell people who are a little scared right, because yeah. of the notorious challenge like you know, don't be scared by that. Don't, don't even like, you know, necessarily expect that you're going to 
beat the game. The important thing is just to have fun. Let's let's dive into some of that because I did want to uh, uh, explore some of the things you've done, especially in that first area, to give it. Because I I certainly did fe- actually feel that it was one area that I wanted to focus on during our chat was that the first game, um, to me very much felt felt like the first area felt like sort of the training wheels. Then it got a little bit harder and it got a little bit harder. And it got got a little bit harder. Um, whereas with Spelunky 2, what I found is um, I did find a point maybe yesterday where I was kind of like, oh, it's taken me a while to like figure out how to get through these areas. I'm just going to focus on like mastering this area or like just exploring it. And then what I decided to do was kind of like, I'm going to figure out what these turkeys are about. You know, I'm going to figure out what the, the thing is there. And there was like three or four different things that I learned about what happens when you kill them and you can jump on them. And like, what's what's this key? And like all that sort of stuff. And the other one that, that struck me was the... Um, the boss that happens, I guess, on one three, I think it is. Um, I, I just spent a couple of runs deciding to see if instead of just getting him to like get me through here, I'm gonna see if I can kill him. I'm just gonna invest in a bunch of bombs and get down there and see if I can destroy him and what happens. Um, those are two examples for me of of how the early game allowed me uh, new ways of playing to like uncover that depth and figure out and and, and like you said, kind of just have fun like play it for that sake for the, the um you know uh f- just for to, to figure out all those mechanics and have to have fun with it and um, is is that the type of stuff you're talking about that you sort of put in is there other things you put in like to give us you know other examples if there are any of the type of things to to sort of encourage players to fuck about that way yeah for sure those are that's exactly the kind of thing that that i'm talking about just you know the game is really trying to kind of distract you from thinking about beating the game you know so you have all of these all of these shorter goals that you can kind of reach for immediately on your journey to eventually getting to the end and winning um and yeah i think you know what you've talked about i think just adding more like npcs like the shopkeeper because the shopkeeper in spelunky one is really central to a lot of people's stories it, it's a character that has you know there are lots of different things that you can do with him and so in Spelunky 2, you know, we've expanded on that. There are just like more variety of shops and the the shopping is is a l- little more nuanced. You know, I've, I've spent more time making it like viable to actually just buy things from the store instead of <laughs> robbing the, the shopkeeper every time. <laughs> um, but yeah, adding new characters like that, like in the first area of the game, there's the there's Yang who's... Um, asking you if you will bring him a couple turkeys you know that's like a something that you can like think about and work on in that first area like okay i'm gonna you know try to bring him turkeys or i'm gonna try to you know like attack him and see if i can i can just like all right i can steal turkeys from him or i'm gonna bring him turkeys and then i'm gonna like steal the turkeys right. after i get the key from him and stuff like he that he doesn't so just like, like if you bring back a dead turkey even if you didn't kill it he is not yeah happy. no no he's not he's he's bringing them because he he loves them as <laughs> as pets um or as friends more like but yeah yeah things like that um and yeah particularly in in the first area i the first area of the game has i, I think the most like variation as far as the mm. different set pieces and and like different types of rooms and stuff like that, just to make it like super, super interesting for people um, when they're starting out and having trouble getting past it. Right. So it's like, you know, it's kind of like a whole arc in and of itself where, yeah, there is a boss at the end and there's like kind of a little quest in the middle and there's always a shopkeeper and there's there's lots of variation in the in the level design and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's kind of meant to be, in a way like it's its own self-contained game in, in a sense and then at the end yeah you get to choose whether you're going to go one way or the other so yeah. there's kind of like an interesting decision at the end there too um do you consider either of those areas harder than the other or do they play differently is there is there do you think there is like a different style of play that's taken from each one or i'm interested because sometimes i really want to go for the jungle area and sometimes i'm like nah, i don't know I'm like kind of better suited. I got a lot of rope this time. Maybe I can get through the <laughs> the hell part. Um, all the stuff that scares me with those bloody fire beetles or whatever there are. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's. But that was something that actually happened a little bit later in development. Like it started with me just. It started more as like a you know just 
thematic design, like mm. having two two levels uh, or two areas that seem very different from one another. But I wasn't exactly sure, you know, what would make one area more compelling to go to than another. So it was more toward the second half of the development where I started thinking about like, okay, it'd be really, it's important that, you know, based on like what items you have or your personality, like which, which area are you going to want to go to more? And so, yeah, some, a lot of that kind of came, came into fruition toward the end um, where I thought specifically about like, okay, if you have like such and such item, let's make it easier to, you know, get through this area versus the other. But it started more as just like trying to make them more distinctive from like a thematic point of view. Um, like liquid, liquid is one of those things where, you know, I want to make sure that like one path had liquid in it and one didn't. So that was, that's right. one like, you know, distinguishing feature where I didn't want like both paths to have, have the liquid in it. Cause it is such a kind of like unique and interesting thing. And, you know, I knew that some people were going to be, um, like more more in love with the that kind of like dynamic feeling of the liquid the like unpredictability of it and stuff like that and then you know the other other things like just the openness of the level design that was another way that you know i tried to separate the two right the two branches and things like that it's awesome uh one of the things we talked a, a lot about when we did our spelunky one documentary um was the evolving nature of the damsels uh where you added in the pug um, uh, yeah. during development on, on uh, Spelunky 1, or I guess the console version was it was where, where all that stuff came in. Or maybe maybe you patched the PC version. Uh, obviously, uh, it's different this time around as well. We have no uh, hunky men. We have no damsels. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a, a beautiful pug. A cat, which I have to tell you, sounds exactly like our cat. And whenever there's like two of the meows it does, every single fucking time we turn around to be like, is Hero <laughs> in the room? Yeah. He's like, yeah, he's a similar sort of fat ginger looking thing. Um, and a hamster as well. Uh, uh, was that on the design doc early, s swapping them out? Yeah, I just I just decided let's just go all in on the, on the pets. You know, the pug ended up being like kind of a mascot for the game and, and <laughs> the most popular damsel. Whoops. I always forget to do that. You're a popular man. This week, it's probably all your friends asking for solutions. Yeah, I'm levels. pretty sure it's just a, another spam message. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that was that was that was there from the beginning, um, and I don't know. It just it just kind of felt like it made sense with like the main characters sort of being like the um, the children of the the right. characters from the original game. It, it felt kind of weird for them to be rescuing like yeah hunky <laughs> hunky people um i hadn't thought i hadn't considered that actually yeah it's a good point. so i don't know i mean maybe part of it is is just me becoming a a parent and right. uh you know kind of i don't know the game's still very the game's still very dark in a lot of ways so i, I don't know that it completely makes sense uh, you know from that perspective um yeah, you can still blow up turkeys and spike spike those little helper people that 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 actually are those guys way smarter? They seem way smarter than before. The AI folks you get out of the um like the helpers, uh Yeah, they are. They're for like sure. so helpful. Man, it's like having a second player. Like half the time. Yeah, we so wanted to improve improve those guys and they, they appear a lot more frequently in the game. Yeah. And earlier? Um, maybe as well i i feel like I'm yeah always they finding... do one of the things that we do in spelunky 2 is that the the coffins where you unlock the player characters now they don't those coffins don't go away when you play again they just replace with hired hands oh that's what it is okay and so you that's partly why you see them more frequently and that's that's kind of just done for a consistent consistency Stability reason, um, mm. because in Spelunky One, you know, people who speed ran the game, um, they would very often reset their save because, ah, uh. like playing the game a lot and unlocking the player characters actually changes. Uh, it actually changes like the chance of getting certain things because those coffins don't appear. Like, yeah, getting a helper, right? Um, right. 
you don't you don't get that once you've unlocked the the character um like the chance of getting a, a helper basically goes down the more you play because of that funny is that also and why so, you added the seated runs as well was that like another nod to the speed running community yeah we uh, we basically got a big list i asked it i asked uh saturnin who's the he's the creator of moss ranking which is like the big <laughs> spelunky speed running site um to just give me like a list of of I, I don't even know if i asked i think he just i think he just gave it over he just said <laughs> here's there's like a list of like community requests and so i was like okay well, we took a look at took a look at it and added the ones that made it sense that made sense um and so yeah, yeah i mean we definitely had that community in in mind when we right. were working on spelunky too because yeah. they you know they've done such a great job just kind of keeping spelunky one active with the all the different challenges and stuff that they've come up with uh you know like like in the past year their challenges have gotten so insane it's just like you could tell these these people are just getting super super bored in some, in some ways with <laughs> with the original game that they've got to invent these just absolutely ridiculous challenges where it's like you know low percent going to hell and only using your whip and they're just like all these variables that they're they're kind of turning on to to make it fun for them um they're able to do and, like uh, eggplant runs in their sleep now so it's just they have to find <laughs> they have to find some reason to to keep the keep the 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 fun alive or keep the it's like they it's like they're murderers they need to like up the ante constantly to try and get yeah. get, get that endorphin rush. right exactly <laughs> yeah it's like yeah the, it's they're starting to to kind of deteriorate and, <laughs> and accelerate their 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 uh their madness so let, let's talk a little bit about i guess that then you know the the enduring legacy of this game right because obviously one of the coolest things that we talked about during uh our documentary was just how much the community took this game around with it obviously you designed the game in this very interesting like you know uh, all about uncovering secrets and then that coupled with the sort of systemic design of it just it created not just like secrets that you had buried really deep in the game but also ones that you hadn't considered that sort of just emerged from this game being popular and 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 people messing around with the systems in it um i have to imagine that that was very much on your mind when you were making spelunky 2 just setting setting everything in motion so that like there will be things that people will discover you know weeks into the game months into the game and perhaps years um is that the case were you like spending a lot of time trying to give make sure that sort of happened again yeah for sure um you know i think the main thing was just yeah the secrets had to go deeper right like you can't just have hell 2.0 or whatever right. so uh i just didn't feel like it would be be quite enough and so yeah there, there's definitely stuff buried in the game for like the, the really hardcore spelunky spelunky speedrunners and stuff like that and you know i i figure that yeah for them actually people have been having a harder time with spelunky 2 like people who played a lot of spelunky 1 have been har having a harder time with spelunky 2 than than i expected i think you know the game fundamentally is pretty similar but i think all those little changes added up actually make it quite quite a new experience for even for people who have played a lot of the first game um you know, like man versus game, the <laughs> the streamer, you know, he he played a ton of Spelunky one, and you know, he was like one of the first people to play Spelunky one and stream it like on Xbox 360. So we actually asked him um, to help us promote the the Steam version and the daily challenge by doing some runs with with other streamers before the game released. And right before Spelunky two came out, he's been He's been streaming himself, trying to just get all the achievements in Spelunky One, right. and so he's like literally going straight from Spelunky One to Spelunky Two, and I've kind of seen that, and he's he's having a lot of trouble <laughs> with Spelunky Two. Um, you know, I think I think in a good way because I I think it would be kind of sad if if he just went straight into Spelunky Two and it was just like, okay, well, I'm just going to take all of my skills from Spelunky One and just blast through the game. Now, it's kind of my worry that that might happen because mm. that's very hard to anticipate, you know, exactly what that's going to be like. But it seems like it is, it is different enough, 
and there are enough new things that it's it's been quite a challenge even for for those people um and i actually think like now is a great time for new players to get in because i don't feel like i don't feel like the game is like that much harder i think it's really that that newness and that you know those differences so if you're not familiar with spelunky one i think if you come in i think the playing field is like relatively level at this point if you get in now i'm I'm really interested in this because i have also felt like like i am having like uh i i am i think my expectation having played a lot of spelunky one is that i can come into this and be like all right here we go i'm a i'm a hot i'm 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 well trained at this i've been playing this for years but i don't know if it's the 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 couple of you know i'm it, it controls the same in so many ways but there are enough ch- changes that i'm coming in with all this confidence but then I'm like coming up against like, oh no, but I actually, I should be more scared because then I'll probably learn a bit faster or something. Um, I, I, a brief tangent. And next week on the podcast, we have the folks from Rogue Legacy 2 on who are, you know, oh, make, awesome. making a say, yeah, we t- I talked to them uh, just yesterday. I had a great conversation about all this. And we also talked about the the challenges of making a sequel and making a sequel that feels like it's harder because also Rogue Legacy 2, for me coming into it, does feel harder than the first game, even if it perhaps isn't on the face of it. And um, we were kind of talking about how the landscape has changed that like there are people have been playing games like it's like the dark souls 2 thing right where when they made dark souls 2 they made a game for people who completed dark souls 1 and it like you know was way more difficult um so you're saying that that wasn't your intention with this it's it's more like why do you think people are finding it harder is it because they like those returning players are maybe more confident than they should be or or also is this just what's going to happen for the first week of a game that like we're, we're too close to launch four or five days from now people will probably be where you expected them to be with difficulty what's what's your sense about about the difficulty uh, with the game it seems like it seems like it's gonna last for a while i mean i just seeing the progress of of people playing the game like you know just going on the spelunky 2 twitch page and just kind of like scrolling down you know you see a lot of brown like a lot of the, the kind of reddish brown color of the first area of the game. <laughs> I love you know, that. The, the, what a great the, piece of QA you have. Uh, <laughs> who needs her? The heuristics? areas are very color coded. So right. it's really funny because you can kind of see, I feel like you could see the overall progress <laughs> just by scrolling and just, it's just like a bunch of, you know, colored squares. And like the more brown it is, I feel like the, the harder time people are having with the game because it means they're all just still stuck in the first area. Um, as to why that is, yeah, I think, you know, when we were working on the game, like on Spelunky 2, we did not spend a ton of time playing Spelunky 1 and just comparing the two. We really just made Spelunky 2 to feel good to mm. us now. So, you know, there might be, part of it might be we have a, a team that is, that is experienced with Spelunky 1 and we've kind of tuned the game to to us. But that said, I don't feel like I'm really like a great Spelunky player, you know, compared to a lot of these streamers who I think have maybe played Spelunky 1 as kind of like, you know, like seriously played it and not just through testing, but have like seriously, you know, tried to play the game and beat it and, and discover all this stuff. We've probably spent more time playing the game and uh, understand it better than, than I do. I, th- I think it's really just all the little differences, hmm. and I think some some significant some significant changes like w- like shoplifting being a little more punishing in Spelunky too. So I think a lot of the inclinations of Spelunky one players are getting punished a little bit by Spelunky two, where the game's not necessarily like a lot harder, you know, but it's it's different and it's kind of subverting some of their expectations. Um, you know, when I play Spelunky 2, I, I actually tend not to rob the shops if I can really help it. Right. Um, and I think, I think that's a much more viable strategy, even like at a high level to, to, to not rob. But, you know, these, these people from Spelunky 1, these players from Spelunky <laughs> 1, just they cannot help themselves when they see a shop. It's just like, it's like just seeing like a, you know, a juicy, like baited trap, and they know that in Spelunky One they could easily just like yeah. grab that bait and then get away, and they just they they're 
yeah, they've kind of been like uh, conditioned. Or, you know, it's like a condition. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's the word. It, yeah, it's like a it's hard. Pavlovian response. It's hard to they just start drooling when they see a, a, a juicy shop. I mean, I've always heard that from uh, developers that it's it's very difficult to unteach something from a player to, to sort of um, uh, get them to to. You know, an old dog and new tricks is one thing, but trying to get a dog to unlearn a trick is almost uh, harder again. Um, I, I, I've taken a bunch of your time. I got three little questions I want to ask, just little sort of design uh, related questions about stuff that you've added or changed in the game that I, I that are very early stuff that I just wanted to sort of um, talk about because I think they're they're interesting and it'll give us a little bit of insight into um, your sort of uh, mindset coming into this. Um, uh, just three of them. The first one, and they're all like pretty small things. The first one is um, in two-player, when you save a pet, you both get a heart now. Um, what what was the idea behind that? Uh, it, it's great. It, it, it's very interesting, especially as me and my wife play very differently. Um, sometimes I'm too aggressive and I get hurt a lot. Sometimes um, I'm a bit more skillful at getting through areas and she gets hurt a lot. So we're doing a lot of like passing pets before we entered the door and obviously when we both got licked this time it was like hooray um, <laughs> but where did that come from uh, just you know giving that to the the player because it's it's a pretty big game changer for two player yeah i think it was just to make it make rescuing the pet more of a cooperative effort and just having everybody's incentives aligned with working together and getting the pet to the exit and yeah i mean two players is it's meant to be like fun it's just like right. more of a, a fun way to play and and it is about cooperation. There there are enough ways to kind of like step on each other's toes in multiplayer. So yeah, that was just one area where it just felt like, yeah, let's just be let's just be nice, you know. And <laughs> yeah, and then people won't fight over the, you know, who gets to to send the pet through the exit. Right. Um, yeah. How about mounts then? Obviously, there's a this is a big system, it feels like, but um I'm just interested in like what was the the main desire? Uh, to include mounts in the game, I think it was just it felt like a just a fun way to interact with an enemy. Essentially, you know, like the the mounts they start wild, um, and a lot of them will attack you. And it just seemed like it'd be, you know, like with Spelunky, there's, you know, we wanted to make sure that the controls stayed very simple because I think that's that's an important part of Spelunky is just really of like the attack button which does so much. You know, you can whip, you can throw, you can pick up items. Um, and so, like, within the constraints of those controls, like, how can we come up with more interesting things that you can do? And getting to ride, yeah, like, ride an animal just seemed, it just seemed like a really fun and interesting thing. You know, you like, you, you can already hold an item in your hands. You can already wear something on your back, like a jetpack or a cape. And so it kind of just like the natural progression is like, well, let's just have something that you can sit on too, right? <laughs> so then you're just like, you know, it's like kind of like thinking about the character as sort of like a, a doll and, you know, like <laughs> where can you right. stick things? Well, there's only one more place that you can kind of like <laughs> stick an, an item. Um, and so the mounts sort of seem like a natural way to do that. That's cool. And so, yeah, I wasn't a, a, entirely sure how it was going to work because it makes you two tiles tall. I think that was yeah. the trickiest thing about the mounts. Um, and initially, it was a little hard to get around, and also the mounts tended to, to die a lot. So we had to kind of like that was something where we, you know, we had to keep kind of working on it over over time to make them make them viable, um, and just make them like. You know, they they started out, I think, pretty bad, and that was that was one of those <laughs> things where we just kept making it better. Where it was just like, you know, should we should we add this? Should we add this? And it was like, well, if it makes the mount better, let's just add it. So right. like, we gave every mount a double jump, basically, because yeah, once you're on the mount, like you can't climb a rope anymore. Was that always the case as well that you couldn't climb a rope when you were on the mount? Yeah, that yeah. was always the case. That just that's the I, that's the risk reward or. Or, or, yeah. or did it just make logical sense that you wouldn't? I be think able to... that that was more like it just made logical sense, right. where it's just like, I don't know, you'd be like squeezing a turkey between your legs <laughs> while you're pulling yourself up. It just, I couldn't We're gonna think start of talking how that about would... realism in Spelunky's universe now. <laughs> you know, I think it's important that, as as ridiculous as video games can get, they 
they do have to have like a certain kind of working logic. Okay. And I, I guess that's where the line is drawn with Spelunky. Like you cannot just like squeeze, squeeze an animal between your legs and pull yourself up a rope. It's, I mean, their legs are tiny. It's just, it, it sounds silly, but like, I really just could not imagine a way of, of making that like look good. I don't know. Right. I like the, You know, those kinds of things do, do matter because they, they help make certain things either feel intuitive or not intuitive. Yeah. And there's already a lot to learn. So you do want these things to feel as intuitive as possible. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of like design decisions that do end up having like a big effect on the, the gameplay do start as just thematic decisions. Like this just makes sense, right? If, you know, we have this, this, and this in place, it just makes sense that, you know, this would be the case. Right. It's interesting. And it starts there and it, it can have a pretty big effect, you know, um, but it's an important part of, it's an important part of, of games. Um, like, you know, it's like in chess, how the knight is the, the only piece that jumps and that just, it, it kind of makes sense, right? Like you're on a horse and the horse right. can leap. Like those kind of kinds of little links I think are, 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 um, yeah, it's, it, there are things that, that, that there are links that game developers think about a lot and it's not just like a bunch of abstract rules like it matters you know what the what the game is about like story wise character wise etc yeah it's interesting i you know i i'm sort of making a joke that like oh it's you know that type of consistency surely it doesn't matter but obviously it it does and and having you explain it there reminded me that one of the realizations i had yesterday when i was playing or the day before yesterday was that um i was on a different mount uh, later in the game and realized that it had an attack and my brain immediately went oh i wonder if the turkeys do too and i imagine a lot of that is the foundation of there being this sort of consistent logic throughout the experience of the game that then i'm extending into these new features that you've also added and um, it's funny talking to you i love talking about spelunky i think i think people who don't make games love talking about spelunky because there's something about the systemic nature of the game that's very easy to grok for people who aren't designers maybe not to like understand and like to be able to make their own game like this but it's it's like that the the a lot of these really complex things that are happening under the hood in games when it comes to design just feel a little bit closer to the surface for the layman or for players and i think that's one of the reasons why people really love talking about this sort of um stuff i, I want to ask you one more of the sort of like ones that i have and it's maybe my favorite um new addition to that first area is the ghost jars <laughs> because oh, yeah. i have terrible impulse control and this is like if me and my wife get divorced it might be over these ghost jars so <laughs> there's these jars in the game now which have it's a diamond right it's like the most uh maybe one of the more expensive uh, jewels you can get in the game i think yeah I remember that's the, the more valuable that's the most valuable one the ghosts turned them you could sort of shepherd the ghost around the gold in the first game right and it would turn them into diamonds but in this there's a jar that if you smash there's a diamond but if you i guess if you smash the jar the ghost like just comes right away yep all right yeah, yeah you're you're an evil bastard for putting this in the game uh, <laughs> where, did, where did it come from what was the idea behind this that was actually another feature that we added primarily to start it was primarily for speedrunners oh. just as a way to get the ghost to arrive earlier so that so that nice. they can kind of choose when the ghost comes because I, I noticed with a lot of like high score runs where they're trying to get the ghost to come and yeah turn all the gems in the in the level to diamonds that there ended up being a lot of waiting if they got kind of all their setup done and then they're just really waiting for the ghost at that point. So it really just is a way for them to kind of decide when the ghost comes. And then it just started getting more interesting once we actually added it. Um, and, and yeah, you know, we, we added the diamond and uh, that creates like a, a risk reward kind of thing for, for everybody, you know, to like, you can make extra money, but you're going to, you're going to have the ghost come come earlier and it also just makes thematic sense because the ghost kind of turns gems into diamonds so it kind of gives you a little bit of a hint there um but it it started as a speedrunner thing that's what like a, actually i think that was one of the i 
I think that was a specific request on that list of requests that I was that I was talking about. But it did not say like add a ghost jar. It was just like it'd be nice if there was a way to make the ghost come come earlier, possibly. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and the so satisfaction of being at the of carrying it to the end and then just like whacking it like a pinata and just getting it and running in the door is like just so satisfying. Um, right, but yeah, you just got to be careful on that on that trip to the the entrance. Yeah, and you don't you don't break it somehow. <laughs> you drop it. It's like it's like an Indiana Jones thing. It's like it's like stepping on the wrong plate or something. Suddenly you're like, uh oh, we gotta go. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's yep. awesome. Uh, Derek, you congratulations on the launch of Spelunky two. Um, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us today. How are you doing this week? The game's out. You know, you you feeling chill? Are you doing a lot of press or, or is there a lot of like patching going on kind of where's your headspace at the moment yeah it's you know it's in that interesting place where you've released the game but your work's not done but you feel like you should relax but you also can't <laughs> and it's it's just i mean i think every game developer feels this way it's just releasing a game it's it's really not like you know winning winning the super bowl or something like that right. it's it's kind of the just immediately the beginning of like the next step of the development um but it's it's been a lot of fun i've been watching tons of streams in general i'm much more chill than i was with spelunky one i think with when we released spelunky one andy and i were both pretty burnt out and i think also just pretty nervous Mm -hmm. and i i didn't had a hard time like watching people play the game so i was just like very concerned about things popping up in the game while they were playing that, you know, bugs or just like people not having a good time and just kind of being stressed out about that. This time around, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling much more chill and just like, just loving watching people w- play the game and die in crazy ways and just like, yeah, cracking up doing that. So it's been, it's been, I think, a more, a more fun and relaxed release, but yeah, we still, we still have a lot to do. And my, my sleep schedule is just completely like topsy turvy <laughs> working primarily with a team in Spain right. and a musician in, in Norway. Oh, we I've didn't even talk like, about, yeah. The returning, uh, uh, uh talents, uh, for, yeah, for yeah, yeah, Eric yeah. yeah, that's awesome is, uh, came back and yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to talk about with the audio too, but maybe we'll, we can save that for yeah. another time. Yeah. Another time. Maybe who knows if you ever want to do a, a second documentary on a Spelunky we're always we're always up for it. Um, sure, but, yeah, but, it'd be fun to get everybody together, get together. the whole picture. Awesome, uh, Derek. Thank you so much. Enjoy the week that's in it, and uh, thanks so much. It's out on PlayStation Four now, and it's coming out on Steam as of this recording next week, or like two weeks time, or something. On the 29th of, 29th of September. Yeah. September. Awesome, cool. And then I'm sure you'll have news on other stuff. Dot dot dot. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. All that Ongoing. Stuff. Yeah. Games. development continues <laughs> exactly awesome <laughs> uh thanks so much man i really appreciate it and thank you to everyone uh, for watching or listening to this week's podcast thanks so much for listening thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time good luck